It is a pleasure to be here. Um, I do hail from Concord, New Hampshire. I grew up there, so I got on exit one, and I traveled to the last exit, and here I am. That was yesterday. Um, but I've never traveled the whole length of 89 before, so it was a new experience to come all the way to the end here. Um, but it is great to be with you. Um, my goal in sharing with you um, is not to gain your financial support in any way. My goal is to encourage you about something that's going on on the other side of the world. And also, I, I'm not going to exhort you, but if you reap some exhortation from that in your own life, then the Lord can do that for you. Um, but I think it is important as Christians or as believers, sometimes we feel like our influence or, or where we have influence is very small. Um, but I have the privilege of going around to a lot of different churches and seeing a lot of different areas where there are faithful Christian people. You have been an encouragement to me this morning, and I want to be an encouragement to you and share about something that's going on on the other side of the world. Um, so without further ado, I'll introduce myself just a little bit. I work under Gospel Fellowship Association, which is a mission down in South Carolina. That's a mission board. So the mission board's responsibility to me and my responsibility to them um, they help me in contacting churches. They're kind of a clearinghouse um, for the donations that come into me, and they sometimes help me deal with governmental regulations in the country I'm in, Papua New Guinea, getting work visas, um, doing all those kind of regulatory things that you have to fulfill in order to be a legal resident of another country. Um, so that's their goal, and then I do report back to them. They provide some accountability to me. Um, and so my mission board is Gospel Fellowship Association, and I have been associated with them since 2005 when I started going short-term to Papua New Guinea. Um, and then this, this my first term started in 2010, my first official term, and I just came back this year in June. Um, so that was a first four-and-a-half-year term to get really saturated in the language and to kind of get my feet wet and get founded in doing what I feel the Lord has called me to do. Let's talk a little bit about Papua New Guinea. I want to give you a few pegs to hang your thoughts on about the country, and then we'll have a short DVD to look at, 10 minutes, and then I'll just finish up with a few um, things after that. But the country of Papua New Guinea, where in the world is it? Um, people find out I live there and are usually confused. Um, so if you know where Australia is, you know where Papua New Guinea is. We're just barely north of Australia. Um, and the island that Papua New Guinea on, there's actually two countries on that island. On the western side, it used to be called Irian Jaya. Now I believe they're just calling it West Papua. Okay, that's an Indonesian-controlled um, country. And then on my side of the island, we're called Papua New Guinea. We are a former Australian colony, and that actually has... Um, my side of the island is a little more advanced. There's more religious freedom. Um, there's generally just more freedom and a little bit more advancement on my side of the island. So when you see the DVD and you see the remote place and the remote, um, very primitive agricultural methods, we're actually pretty advanced, okay, for my island. And the other side is much um, more remote and primitive. Um, so it's a uh, former Australian colony. Um, they gained independence from Australia in 1975, and that was done peacefully. Um, it was basically an agreement that authority was handed over to the native peoples, and that was in 1975. Um, you, there's all kinds of different terrain in Papua New Guinea. There's low, coast, um, low coastal swamps and, and huge rivers, and people live along those rivers, and they live in the swamps, and they have a totally... Um, culture unto themselves, a culture that is totally unto themselves. I live in the central highlands. Um, the mountain that our range comes off of is 7,000 feet high, and the village is at about 65 to 6,800 feet high. Um, we have a river gorge that's 3,500 feet below us, and then we have a mountain on the other side that's 11,000 feet. So that's kind of what the terrain is like. Um, it's very mountainous in my area. Because of that, it's very temperate, and the people's staple food is the white sweet potato. Um, so that is what they spend all of their time doing, is subsistence farming. So they farm to subsist. They do their, all of their agriculture is just focused on daily survival. And if you want to kind of put yourself in their shoes for a minute, okay, think about when you wake up, the things, the three things that are going to fill your time for that entire day is finding water, 
digging or reaping your food, harvesting your food, and then finding firewood. And that can fill up your whole day, and that only supplies you for one day. Um, so that's kind of how they live. It's a very day-to-day -day existence. Um, they do everything by hand. Machetes, axes, and fire is basically the only tools that they have, along with some um, digging shovels for the ladies in the sweet potato gardens. Um, but that is how they live, very survival-based. As you see that in the DVD, um, do cut them a little bit of slack, okay? Um, they've only had contact with Western civilization of any type since the 1930s, in the late 30s. That was a very brief um, episode of contact with two Australian men who were looking for gold. They came up into the mountains looking for gold. They found thousands of people living there. Um, so that was in the 1930s. Then World War II happened, and you have a time where there wasn't a lot of contact because um, of the fighting going on. And then after World War II, Australia takes over my half of the island, and they would call it, they pacified the tribe. So we were using stone axes, cannibalism, tribal fighting, um, all of that was still going on even into the 50s until the Australians gradually um, made inroads in with um, patrols and they did a really good job of being gentle with these people but still teaching them um, certain basic things about law and order. And um, they did that until 1975 um, when the government was granted to the people. And the main focus of my first term has been language work. In an area the size of the state of California, there's 800 tribal languages. Okay, That makes things a little difficult for communication among themselves and then among Westerners to them. Um, and there is a little debate. Some people will say there's not quite that many languages. Some of those are dialects, so it's more like 650 or 700. But the general number that people say is between seven and 800 different tribal languages. I had worked in Papua New Guinea from 2005 to 2007 as a medical person um, with evangelism alongside of that, and I had worked in the trade language. Okay, If you have heard of a country that has a trade language, it's like an umbrella language that people of different languages within the country can use to communicate with each other, usually for business, for trade, for contracts, in our case. Um, our people have to go to town and buy the occasional bag of salt or cooking oil or whatever they need, so they would use the trade language to do that. And then also, many times they contract marriages with people of different language groups, um, so in order to make those arrangements, which are very thorough, okay, you have to be able to communicate, so they use a the trade language for that. But when they are in their own village, speaking to their own people, they use their tribal language 80 to 90 percent of the time. I was working in a clinic, I was dealing with people, I was listening to them speak to me in the trade language, I was diagnosing them, I was giving them instructions in the trade language. But as soon as they left my little exam room and they went out into the hallway where their um, family member was waiting, they didn't speak to each other in the trade language, okay, they spoke to each other in their heart, tribal heart language. So as I was doing that medical work back in 2005 and 2007, in the trade language, I was burdened that we are not really communicating to these people in the language that they prefer to use. And how much more effective our witness would be, and any work that we do, medical or evangelistic, how much more effective would that work be if we were using the language that they preferred, and the language that is actually much more articulate, um, has a much wider range of vocabulary, and much greater range of effectiveness. So that was my burden. I was kind of gearing towards medical missions and using my nursing, but then God was giving me a burden for tribal language work. Um, the place where I was doing medical work didn't have that same burden, um, but in 2007, at the end of the year, a missionary in another village contacted me who was also working under Gospel Fellowship Association, and he said, our village is more remote than where you are. Our people use the tribal language even more than where you're working and doing the medical work. What would you think about coming to our village and helping the church planting work? This man was doing a church planting work, but doing it in the trade language, and he felt like he wasn't being as effective as he could be. And he wanted someone to come alongside, learn the tribal language, and come alongside the church planting work. Be working with the ladies and children and the elderly people who are not as apt to know the trade language because they knew the tribal language CR. So that was kind of the Lord's open door to me, 
And um, I came back to the States and do what missionaries do before they go to the field full time. And then in 2010, um, I was able to go. Um, so my primary work on the first term was learning the language, the tribal language, which is called CR. As you view the, view the DVD, you'll see all these different names, okay? CR, tribal language, heart language. So that all refers to one thing, the language called CR. And that language is just spoken in my village by about 1,500 people who live there. Then you'll hear trade language, Melanesian pidgin, or just pidgin, and that all refers to one thing, basically the trade language. And that's the language that they use when they go out of the village to other um, different language areas. So my work has been to um, learn the tribal language CR with the goal of using that for evangelism and discipleship for Bible teaching, eventually starting literacy work. And then, if the Lord so leads and they are enthusiastic about being literate in their own language, then we can um, talk about doing a Bible translation in the future. But I think that's enough to kind of give you a little um, skeleton of, um, of what the DVD will be about. Um, so we can view the DVD now, and then after that I'll finish up with a few more things. Many also use the locally grown and 
reputedly potent marijuana freely, and a few have become known locally as drug buyers. People who have used marijuana so frequently and heavily that they have significant mental and behavioral changes. The Highlanders of Papua New Guinea are similar to people groups all over the world. Though outwardly religious and superficially happy, they are groping in darkness for fulfillment, pleasure, and a pacified conscience. They have good days, they have bad days, they are born in darkness, they live, they die in darkness, estranged from their Creator God. reconciliation in Christ. An effective ambassador is a good communicator, and my main role on the church planning team has been one of increasing our communication abilities in the tribal language, CR. The goal of this language work is to come alongside the existing church planning work being conducted in Melanesian Pigeon and use the tribal heart language, CR, as an effective tool in evangelism and discipleship. Learning an unwritten tribal language calls for complete immersion in the language as well as the culture that accompanies that language. To facilitate this total immersion, teammates and villagers helped mill local lumber for the construction of a small house to be located in the village park. In the fall of 2012 and again in 2013, Work teams from my home church came to Kiari and erected a small secure house in the Ak neighborhood of Kiari. After moving into this house in the fall of 2013, I have been able to accompany women and children to their gardens, weeding and planting alongside them while listening to their chatter, asking questions and taking notes whenever possible. I have spent late afternoons and evenings visiting the rooms listening as they recount traditional stories and village gossip in the tribal language while they cook their evening meal over an open fire. I have also engaged in more intentional learning sessions one-on-one -on -one with native speakers, searching out specific points of grammar, vocabulary, and the particular sounds of the language. In mid-2014, we and Hongo Two local ladies started helping me translate a 70 lesson chronological Bible series geared to teach tribal people of God's provision of Christ, starting in Genesis and ending with his ascension in the book of Acts. In November of 2014, I started teaching through this series with the local ladies three mornings each week. Attendance fluctuated from as low as three to the mid 20s. Prayer partners in the United States prayed regularly, and a core group of five ladies completed the entire series over six months. Though none had made a clear decision for Christ, Esther, one of the faithful attenders, made a comment like this. The things we have learned are new and very good, but we need to hear them again. I keep forgetting what you have taught us. If you could teach us how to read, we could look in the Bible and see and understand and remember. What work remains to be done? In future terms, I will continue to revise and teach the lesson series to interested individuals and groups in the numerous neighborhoods scattered over the several villages that compose Kiari. I will also continue to minister in the mission clinic two mornings per week, providing medical care with spiritual counseling and an opportunity for church leaders to evangelize. There is also a great need for literacy work in both the tribal and trade languages in order to evangelize and disciple. Literacy in the trade language, Melanesian Pigeon, stands at about 30%, and 
and currently there are no written materials available in the CR language. Work on creating a writing system for the CR language began in May of 2015 when Dr. Grace Hargis gave up her time and abilities and came to Kiari. She helped create an alphabet compatible with the CR language as well as helped to start developing a primer to teach reading in the CR language. These are foundational tools to a future literacy program and eventual translation work, both of which are key to Christians growing and the unsaved believing. The CR people are only one of many lost people groups in Papua New Guinea and the world. They live estranged from God, often unaware of that estrangement and their need of Christ. Their Creator God desires that they would see and know the light of His truth and ultimately be reconciled to Himself. All right, I hope that kind of fleshes things out for you and gives you a fuller picture of um, what's going on there, what the kind of goals are of the ministry there. I would like to just take a few minutes. Um, just real briefly and help you understand based on your gender okay in your age where you would fit into the daily life of the village kind of what life in the village would be like for you and then how does someone who desires to communicate Christ with you how do they interact with you to accomplish that um, so we'll start with the kids we have a few kids in here right I think I see okay um, so children Living in Papua New Guinea in a village is a little bit different. You're going to have daily chores every day, and if they don't get done, you don't even get to eat, okay? So you need to help your mom basically cook the meals. So what you, one of your responsibilities is going to be every day your mom is going to give you an empty plastic container in the morning, and she's going to send you off. Okay, you're going to take that plastic container and go to the nearest stream, fill it up, and haul it back with water in it, okay? And that's so your mom can boil her uh, the sweet potatoes for you so you can eat them. And then another chore that the children will have to do every day is gather small bits of firewood that their mom can use as kindling. Your dad is probably going to go get the bigger pieces of firewood and split those with an axe and, and make those available to your mom. But you're going to need to gather the little sticks, um, pieces of bark that have fallen off of trees in the forest, all those kinds of things. Bring those into your mom so she can cook your sweet potatoes for you. And then, children, another thing you would want to know is that your school year is very irregular. The school year, we are down under, so we're the, our seasons are um, opposite of America. So your school year starts in February, and it's supposed to go until the middle of November. But it usually only goes until May or April. Okay. That's because your teachers, they're from the city, and they don't like to come and live in the village. They come, and they feel real good about what they're doing for about two or three months, but then when they realize they don't get to have a soda, and there's no beer, and there's no meat, and there's none of those wonderful things in the village, so the teachers usually give up and go back to town, and school's over for the year. Um, so kids, that's kind of what your school year would be, would be like, but do you know what? That means that a lot of you don't learn how to read, okay? So out of every 10 children in the village, probably only two or three of them know how to read. And that continues on into adulthood. So kids, that was what life would be like for you there in the village. Um, we'll go to the ladies. We'll do the men first, and then we'll, the ladies are a little more complicated. <laughs> so men, um, your roles in the village, um, you are the dominant figure in your home, um, also in the village. Basically, your word goes and nobody really argues with you. Um, so your role in the village, um, some of the things or tasks that you would be responsible for, one is, we already mentioned, providing firewood for your family, and that's almost a daily task, either um, felling a dried tree um, that's on your property, cutting it into sections, and then you gradually work through that tree and provide it to your family for firewood, or going out scavenging in different parts of the bush to get firewood and bring it back. Um, another thing you're responsible for is to clear the land and then create a stockade-style fence around the exterior of the land to um, make gardens. And if you have more than one wife, you've got a lot of land to clear, okay? Because each the wives 
don't cooperate together in the polygamous relationships. They have their own dwelling, they have their own gardens, and that usually makes things a little less volatile in the home. But men, you'll have to be doing that for your wife or wives, and that is an intense amount of labor. It can take up to three or four months for a man to build a fence. That's from felling the tree to splitting it into sections, to splitting those sections into um, logs or posts, and then every single post is sharpened to a sharp point on each end, so it can be driven into the ground, the, post, the points on the top discourage people from jumping over and getting into your garden to steal food, and it also makes it so the water runs off and the posts don't rot as quickly. Um, so that's one of the, the most labor-intensive things that the men do. It does occupy a lot of their time. Another thing, men, that you would be responsible for is tending to your coffee plot, and um, that is not quite as labor-intensive. Um, you have to cut the bush down around it, keep the um, stumps clear of tall weeds and things during most of the year. And then you harvest it, usually in June is the big harvest, which means picking each coffee bean by hand, okay? You get sore arms and a sore neck, picking each coffee bean by hand, and then you bring, it's actually not a bean, it's in the cherry form, so you have a bag of coffee cherries, Carry that back to your house. If you have a coffee mill, you can run it through the coffee mill to skin it. So you skin the skin of the cherry off and the bean is left inside. Um, the bean is exposed. Um, or you can take every single one of those coffee cherry skins off by hand, which is what a lot of people do, and that's usually given to the women to do. All right, so once you've got the skin off the coffee cherry, then you can dry it for three days, and then you get to carry it into town, which is about a two-day trip, with half of it being walking, and they'll carry as much as 30 kilograms, or around 65 um, pounds of coffee on their backs into town to sell. And that's how you make cash for your family. Um, that could pay a child's school fee for their secondary education, if you happen to be that ambitious to pursue that. Um, or it could just provide cash for little things like clothes or a new pot or things like that. So that's the men's kind of role. Um, and just kind of put in the back of your um, thinking, men, that you are the authority based on your gender, okay? I, as a woman, I can argue with you, but ah, what I say doesn't matter, okay? It's what the man says that matters. That's just how things are there. Um, ladies, um, <clears throat> You, a few things that you would want to know is that when you're married, you're married at a fairly early age, probably between 16 and 17. When you were married, your brothers got together with the guy who wanted to marry you, and they negotiated with him for how much cash and pigs you were worth. Okay? So once they have reached an agreement, then an exchange is made of cash and pigs, and there's a big feast and many, many... All of the relatives come, it's a very big deal, and then they're considered married once that whole payment has been made, both in cash and pigs. So ladies, that's all right, that gives you some value, right? Well, it does, but at the same time, it kind of categorizes you as the man's possession. And he has now, he now owns you, and he can really do whatever he wants to with you, ask you to do anything, and then treat you however he desires. And sometimes that is not very good. Other men in the village will not step in and intervene for your assistance when your husband is beating you because they see it as though it's his. He can do what he wants with it, and I don't have a right to come between him and his wife and protect her or do anything like that. So that is just normal everyday life. Beatings are normal. Um, and that's how the men and women interact. So ladies, just put that in the back of your mind and then understand that you are also responsible for most of the daily manual labor that it takes to survive. Okay, you leave your house early in the morning with a pig and a kid and a string bag, which is an example on the table back there, and you go to a sweet potato garden. You may change elevation as much as 1,500 feet, either down or up, and you may go as far as two miles away. Um, these are not little backyard plots. They're huge cleared areas that they planted, and they have land in all kinds of different places in the village that they go to. So you'll go there, you'll spend almost your whole day there, You'll be weeding, you might be planting a new section, harvesting. You want to make sure you bring enough sweet potatoes back in the evening for the family's evening meal, to feed the pigs their evening meal, and then to have enough for breakfast the next morning. They usually just eat in the morning and the evening. That could be as much as 60 to 65 pounds of sweet potatoes that the ladies will haul on their backs back to home. If you went down 1,500 feet and you had to carry it back up, that's quite a chore. Um, so the ladies, that is something that would be routine for you. 
Um, so that's your, you're the main thing the family depends on for their food survival. Um, another thing, ladies, and this is the last thing that you would want to know is whenever a man or a prominent male in the village dies, the thinking of the men in the village automatically goes to sorcery that is performed by women to kill men. And they believe, the men believe that the women have this power to perform this sorcery. They call it sanguma. Um, so a prominent male in the village has died or a male child has died. Maybe an eight-year-old boy didn't seem to be sick, um, had a seizure and died. Okay, these kind of things happen in the village because we have no screening. We don't know what illnesses people have. Sometimes they just die. Um, so this happens. Uh, the death has occurred. The men in the village will round up the women. They will make accusations of certain women. Okay, they will pull those women out of the group. They will, it's almost like um, trial by threats or trial by even sometimes a hot iron in the fire against their skin. Accuse them and tell them that they have committed sorcery to cause this death. Um, the women obviously become afraid. Sometimes they admit to doing it so that they are not immediately harmed. Um, sometimes they will accuse another woman. And I can understand why they would do that. Someone, we've had it happen in our village at gunpoint. And I can imagine that I would be calling someone else's name if there was a pistol to my head. Um, but these things happen. And then sometimes they do result in the beating or death of the woman. And that is seen by the men as protecting their clan. This, they really truly believe that this woman has the power to harm their community and that by eliminating her, they're actually protecting and acting in goodwill towards the community. So that is one of those um, very frustrating times to be in the village and where you see that Satan has used um, deception to really twist their thinking and to enslave them to himself and that the people who believe they are acting in the good of the community are actually being used by um, Satan to act against the good of the community. Um, so ladies, that is something that you would be, it's not something you'd face every day. When I was there for four and a half years, we probably had incidents like that come up three times in four and a half years. None of them in that particular time resulted in death, but we did have a lot of Christians praying um, when those accusations were being made. Um, so that was encouraging to see that none of them went that far, as far as they could have gone. Um, so how do you how do you um, talk to people like this? All right, how do I, as a foreigner, as an outsider, as someone who doesn't have any cred, okay, in their community, how do I talk to them? Well, I don't tell them what I think, all right, and I don't tell them what my denomination thinks. What I all we do is I present this to them as God's word, which I believe it is, and it takes faith to believe that, but I believe that this is God's word and his revelation to us. Um, we start in Genesis with creation, and we teach them, have you ever thought about creation and how much that tells you about God? <laughs> okay, All the different things that that tells you about God. And one thing that's very important for them is God was first. Okay, He created angels. One of those angels fell away. And we believe that that was Satan. Okay, If God created Satan, should you be fearing him? Or should you be fearing the one who created him? All right? And that is one of the things. They do do things like they sacrifice and burn leaves to spirits to help them things help out when someone is ill. And we try to encourage them. You are an appeasing and a slave to something that is stronger than you. Yes, I believe that there are demons and things there that are stronger than me spiritually and that are evil. But that's not what I'm afraid of. God is greater than those things. And just teaching them that, even through the story of creation. Okay, working through that too, you have the fall, teaching them about um, Adam and Eve and the fall, where they have transgressed God's clear command, and then taking them up to the Ten Commandments. And we always, when we teach, we say, okay, here's, this is the commandment, the commandment, the commandment. Now, who of you thinks that you can keep all of these just today? Okay, and we have lots of volunteers. Um, but then that, that lesson is actually over two days, and the next day we come back and talk about it again, and there's some conviction, all right? So God has given these laws, and I have broken them. I am not rightly related to him. That's a problem, that I'm not rightly related to the creator of the world. 
Um, and then we go through until we have the promise of Jesus Christ who allows us and brings us back into that right relationship with God and that that is their answer. Now I taught through that whole lesson series. It was 70 lessons. It took us six months and no one made a decision for Christ. Okay, so then I packed my bags and went home. No. <laughs> um, we understand that this is a work of the Holy Spirit, and we did have people getting early truth, like a lady who told me, one of the ladies who's in the video, but the other lady who told me, you know what? And she was talking to someone else, actually. Karen doesn't tell us her own thoughts. All she tells us is what's in here. And just that she got that simple truth that what was being presented was something that God was wanting to communicate to her, not that Karen was wanting to. Um, so I'm encouraged by that and hoping as I continue living among them um, that these things will become clearer to them, both just in daily life, the daily testimony of living with people, and then as the Lord allows to continue to do those classes, to do literacy so that those people can actually read what's in here. They already have a Bible in the trade language, but they can't read the trade language. So doing trade language literacy, doing tribal language literacy, and then if they're excited about reading in their own tribal language, providing them a translation in their tribal language, um, in their heart language, something that really communicates to them so that they can be clear about what God wants to communicate to them. And think about it, God has given us this book. Um, and I believe that if he thought it was that important to give it to us, and hundreds of years ago it gradually made its way into English so we can have it here, um, but there are still peoples without it and without this as a witness to them and that um, it is our duty to at least pray for that to happen for other people um, but then whoever can be involved with it to be involved with it. I just want to share one verse with you and then I'll close. Um, and I will, I have a little sign-up sheet on the back table if you'd like to get a prayer letter because that is something I crave if, um, I don't. I know that there are tons of missionaries out there, and I don't pray for them all. But if the Lord leads you specifically to pray for me, please do. And even if you just want to be informed about what's going on over in Kiari, then you can sign up to receive the prayer letter. That sign-up sheet's on the back table, email or snail mail. And um, you can do that after the service. And I'll be back there to answer questions also. But I do just want to close with this verse, Revelations 5, 9. This is at the end of time, so this hasn't happened yet, but the Lord has... Reveal this to us and let us know that it is going to happen at some point. And these are people who are around the throne of God. So they're redeemed people. They're not just angels, okay? Redeemed people who are singing this to Christ. And they're saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof. For thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God by thy blood out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation. Every kindred and tongue and people and nation. And I believe though that there are CR speakers in my village. There already are some who are saved because of the church plan. Okay, they are believers in Christ. There's many speakers next to us. That's kind of like a dialect of us. There aren't any believers there. There's Kewa Mabu speakers further up the road. There's across the river the language that I don't even know the name of. It's totally unintelligible to my people. Okay that there are going to be people from those language groups too at the end of time around the throne of God. And we're told that here, and that's a promise that I claim for my own people in the Kiari area, the CR speakers, but also for those other speakers of all of those 800 languages in Papua New Guinea. Um, so that is a promise um, to claim, but also um, an encouragement and a privilege that God lets us be involved in that gathering in of people. Why does he involve us? I don't know, because we don't really do it very well often, um, but that he does, and that that is a privilege, and I'm um, glad that he has allowed me to be a small part of that, and a small part of the world, just with those 1,500 people that speak CR, um, but um, I'm very thankful that he has given me that privilege. So thank you for letting me present that. I hope it encourages you. If it exhorts you, great. Um, but we'll let the Lord do that in your heart. And I would appreciate your prayers as you feel led to pray for me. Thank you.